welcome back. Um, so what we're gonna do today is the spirometry lab. And we kind of introduced the idea of breath volumes or lung volumes last class when we were doing those dry spirometers where you go <sighs> blow into that little thing and see your total amount of exchangeable air. Um, you know, today we're going to do a much more sophisticated way of um, looking at your breathing. Um, so I'm going to just briefly go over the ideas of lung volumes and also the idea of flow, the airflow coming in and out. Um, and then we'll kind of just dig into the lab itself. So let's continue there. All right. So in this lab, rather than use that little dry spirometer that people you just blow and can only tell if you're blowing out and you have to blow really hard and all of that, we're going to do something much more sophisticated. And it's basically going to be this tube that you hold in your mouth. And then it has this part here. It actually has a little screen. So this, you can't really see the screen unless you look, you can actually see it if you look through it. But so this is screen you know, with resistance. It's got a certain amount of resistance to flow. You can still breathe through it pretty easily, but there is some actual resistance. Um, and then there are these plastic tubes that come off the top that go to the computer system. And the computer system actually can measure what is the pressure difference between those two tubes. Um, so this is the basic setup. The official word for this whole thing is the a pneumotachometer. Kind of measuring airspeed flow, la la la. So basically, you're probably, if, if, if you're being, if you're kind of, the wheels are clicking here, you're thinking, oh my God, pressure, resistance, I have everything I need to calculate flow, right? Because flow and pressure difference and resistance are all related by your super familiar formula by now. Flow is just the pressure difference over the resistance. All right, so R is just a constant based on the screen. Pressure difference is being measured by the little computer, this thing they call the spirometer pod. It's basically a little um, peripheral that we have attached to the computers. And so our program, our chart program, can just calculate the flow. So that's how the system is going to work. It's going to actually be able to just let you breathe in and out, and it will be able to calculate the flow based upon measuring this pressure and knowing this formula. Um, I should say, you always need to make sure you put a nose thing on, a nose plug, because even if you don't think you're breathing through your nose, you probably are, and it's gonna affect your results here. So this is the basic system. Um, some conventions, flow, what are units for flow? What are the units of flow we've been using for the blood and everything? Flow is measured in what, in general? Liter per minute. Yeah, exactly. Liters per minute. Um, we are going to have a sign signing convention. We're going to say positive if inhaling, negative if exhaling. 
So that means if you had like minus one, that means you're blowing out. Minus five, meaning you're blowing out much, much higher flow. One would be you're breathing in. Five, you're breathing in with a much more like impulsive um, flow, or I should say much larger volume per minute flow. So there's both the magnitude as well as the sign, which direction is it coming in or out of your mouth? So that's kind of important to know. So that's one thing that we are gonna be able to look at is the flow. Um, and again, we can see whether it's coming in or out and if it's really fast or whether it's kind of more mellow. And it turns out from flow, you can calculate the volume. Volume is just the integral of flow. Let me start a new page. So volume is just the integral of flow with respect to time. Integral, an integral is just a fancy kind of summation. It's, so it's basically saying the more air that's flowing in, the more the volume is going to keep getting bigger. It's like you know, thinking the more you flow into a balloon, the balloon keeps blowing up. If you have a negative flow, the more negative flow you have, the more the volume is going to start going down because you are losing air. So if we look at, in fact, on our screens on the computer, we'll have two, two different graphs. We'll have one graph that's going to be flow in liters per minute. It's a zero, you know, this would be, you know, holding your breath, nothing coming in or out. Here, I'm sucking in, now I'm holding my breath. Here I'm blowing out, now I'm holding my breath again. So whenever this is positive, I'm inhaling. Whenever this is negative, I'm exhaling. When it's Larger positive, I'm inhaling faster here. I'm inhaling slower and slower until I'm holding my breath again. Now I'm starting to blow out slowly at first and then faster and then less, and now I'm holding my breath again. So this is flow, liters per minute. But then the other graph we're gonna see is the volume. Basically, it's you know, it's going to be whatever it is at the moment. Don't worry about it's all. This is going to for our purposes. It's all going to be relative. So you're going to start the moment we have an inhalation. The volume is going to start going up, right? So any for this entire period of time when we're inhaling, this is going to go up. As I'm inhaling less fast, it's not gonna go up as fast. Once I have zero flow, meaning I'm not breathing in or out, the volume is gonna stay constant, right? The volume is not gonna change if my air isn't coming in or out. And then the moment I am starting to breathe out, the volume will go down until when I hit this place, it's gonna be, so this is, something to pay attention to. There's two very different things that are being measured on the screen. This top part is going to be the flow, it's going to be a measure of how fast is the air moving in or out and which direction. Is it positive, you're sucking in, negative, you're inhaling. If it's zero, you're holding your breath. Volume is just watching as the volume in the lungs is going up or going down. So are there any questions about that basic relationship? Okay, so then briefly, let's talk about basic lung volumes. So we could say zero. So 
when you breathe out, you obviously still have air in your lungs. Um, so if you're just breathing in and out quietly, this distance that is going up and down, either inhale or exhale, the volume here, so we're looking at volumes here in liters. This is what we call tidal breathing, or we call that volume the tidal volume. It can be V sub T or also called TV. And typically it's around 0.5 liters. It's about a half a liter. The normal amount of air you breathe in or breathe out during a quiet inhale or exhale is about a half a liter. So that's called tidal breathing. And that's volume is tidal volume. Um, obviously, if I want, I can breathe in above a normal inhale. So I go breathe into a normal inhale and then up above a normal inhale and then back to quiet breathing. This amount here that I can breathe above a normal inhale, that's gonna be what I call my inspiratory reserve volume. Also called the IRV. Um, important to realize and remember, it's the amount from a normal inhale up to the most you can breathe in. So it's the amount above a normal inhale that you can breathe in. Obviously, you can usually breathe out more than a normal exhale. So if you breathe out, but then <laughs> back, then this amount you can breathe out below a normal exhale, that's my expiratory reserve. Expiratory reserve volume, I should say. You know, these numbers are different for different people, but like the same way a, a typical tidal volume is like 0.5 liters. Typical inspiratory reserve is usually around three liters. Typical expiratory reserve is usually around one liter. And notice here, even during an expiratory reserve, you don't blow every last bit out. There's still some air left in here. They call that the residual volume. Um, that residual volume is actually what makes it possible to do the Heimlich maneuver, right? Somebody is choking. <coughs> they have coughed out, breathed out the last bit of air that's possible for them to, to cough out. There's nothing left that they can re push out. They've expended the last of their expiratory reserve, but there's still something stuck in their throat Somebody can go and manually kind of compress their chest and increase the pressure enough to sh shoot out a little more of this residual air that's still actually in their lungs that, that they don't have the ability to get rid of. And that's what provides the little air that pushes out when you do the Heimlich maneuver, is that residual volume there. Um, so tidal volume, expiratory reserve, inspiratory reserve. And then if you put them all together, basically the most you can breathe in to a normal breath, to the most you can breathe out, then that's called the vital capacity. This is gonna be basically IRV plus tidal volume, plus ERV, right? It's like the most you can breathe in, to the most you can breathe out, and then back to normal. This to here, here to here, and here to here. 
um, VC. Um, sometimes we use what's called the FVC, forced vital capacity. In fact, we're gonna use this in our lab today. And this is where you blow out as hard as you can. <sighs> um, for most people, that should be the same as a normal vital capacity. But if you have, um, if your airways are restricted, um, it actually becomes less. You have trouble getting that air out when you're trying to um, get it out fast. Um, so vital capacity we'll be looking at in our class today. When we first, you know, the first thing we're going to be doing is just measuring these different things under normal breathing. And then you can actually use those values to calculate the vital capacity, just doing um, add three things together. Um, next, we're going to do these pulmonary tests where we actually have people, or have Becky did it for you, um, suck in as much as she can, blow it all out as fast as she can, and then we're gonna look at what happens there. Um, FVC, the force vital capacity, the other thing you'll need to know is FEV1. This is force expiratory volume in one second. So that's basically, you've breathed in as much as you can and <laughs> you breathe out as much as you can. It's like, how much were you able to breathe out in one second? So what is this volume that you were able to get rid of in one second? And then you actually compare it to the overall, this is the vital capacity, the total amount and if you have, if you have these um, kind of obstructive pulmonary disorders, typically this ratio FEV1 over FVC is going to be lower, like around 50% or something. If you have normal, normal lung function, this should be like 75% or above. So. This is used clinically to see if someone has some kind of obstructive pulmonary disorder. Because if they do, they are not able to blow the air, you know, blow out a substantial proportion of their vital capacity in one second. You know, if, if their airways are constricted, even if they have a lot of pressure, the flow is going to be lower. So we're going to be looking at this. Um, and then just for completeness, I'll just mention, not, oh, I'll, I'll mention it when we do later. So let's let's enter into the lab itself. Or maybe I should say first. Are there any questions about any of this up to this point? Yes, no? Do people get the difference between flow and volume? I mean, how is yes. how, okay? Because that's that's important. Because when you look at these graphs, they both go up and down as you're breathing, but you want to make sure you understand there's something fundamentally different about them, but that they're also really related. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna see somebody on YouTube basically kind of explain those same things I just told you, but with prettier pictures. And if you kind of got it, this should hopefully make you get it even better. Let me, here it is. So doing the lab spirometry. So first, I'm just gonna have you watch. So she talks about some other things that you don't need to know. The only ones, the volumes you need to know are tidal volume, inspiratory reserve, expiratory reserve, vital capacity, forced vital capacity, FEV1, and then also think about this ratio of FEV1 to FVC. 
And let us watch our cool little video. Um, what is it? Hold on. This is not what you're supposed to be watching. Um, this is what you're supposed to be watching. Spirometry is a common test for lung function. It is used to diagnose asthma, COPD, pulmonary fibrosis, and other lung diseases. It can also be a helpful tool to monitor disease progression and evaluate effectiveness of a treatment plan. A tube-like device called a spirometer is used to capture and record air volumes and breathing speed. A spirometry test typically reports four respiratory volumes, tidal volume, TV, the amount of air inhaled or exhaled during normal quiet breathing without effort, inspiratory reserve volume, IRV, the amount of air that can be inhaled with maximum effort after a quiet inhalation, expiratory reserve volume, ERV, the amount of air that can be exhaled with maximum effort after a quiet exhalation. Residual volume, RV, the amount of air remaining in the lungs after a maximum exhalation. These volumes are used to calculate other parameters called respiratory capacities. Inspiratory capacity, IC, the maximum amount of air that can be inhaled after a quiet exhalation. Functional residual capacity, FRC, the amount of air remaining in the lungs after a quiet exhalation. Total lung capacity, TLC, and vital capacity, VC, the amount of air. I should mention, there's no way to actually measure residual volume or to get total lung capacity either because since you aren't able to blow that out, um, you can't, so you can calculate an approximation. It's, I think they say it's like, I think 1.25 times your vital capacity is a good approximation. But this residual volume and all these things that rely on residual volume, those are not things that you can actually accurately measure in the ways we measure things. So just kind of, so don't worry about these inspiratory capacities or total lung capacity or anything. You know, the things you need to know are, again, inspiratory reserve, tidal volume, vital capacity. That can be exhaled with maximum effort after a maximum inhalation. This is basically the volume of the deepest breath the lungs can possibly handle and is an important indicator of pulmonary function, as well as strength of respiratory muscles. Vital capacity can be measured as slow vital capacity during slow, relaxed breathing, or as forced vital capacity, FVC, when the patient is asked to breathe out as hard and fast as possible. While there is little or no difference between these two values in healthy individuals, people with difficulty exhaling usually show significantly lower FVC. Another important parameter obtained during forced spirometry is the forced expiratory volume, FEV1, the amount of air that is exhaled during the first second of forceful exhalation after a full inhalation. FEV1 is used to calculate the percentage of air that is expelled during the first second. This FEV1 over FVC ratio inversely reflects the resistance to expiratory airflow. In healthy people, it is around 70 to 85%. A smaller number means increased lung resistance. Spirometry is useful in differentiating between restrictive and obstructive pulmonary diseases. Restrictive lung diseases can be inspiratory or expiratory. Inspiratory restrictive are conditions in which lung compliance is reduced, limiting lung expansion when inhaling. This can happen either because the lungs become stiff as a result of scarring or fibrosis within lung tissues, or the respiratory muscles are too weak to inflate the lungs. Expiratory restrictive is when exhalation volume is limited due to weakness of accessory muscles involved in deep exhalation. Restrictive lung diseases are associated with decreased lung volumes or total lung capacity, TLC. Obstructive lung diseases, such as asthma or COPD, on the other hand, 
show a normal or somewhat increased total lung capacity, TLC. This is because the obstruction increases lung resistance, making breathing out harder and slower. And this results in increased residual lung volume. Vital capacity remains normal during quiet breathing, but when breathing rapidly, a higher pressure is required to overcome the increased resistance, and forced vital capacity is reduced. A more reliable indicator of obstructive lung disease, however, is the lower percentage of air that is exhaled during the first second of forceful exhalation. Okay. All right, so that, I think she does a, a nice job of covering the important stuff there. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna start this running here and we might as well just watch it together in case people have comment questions after it. But basically, this is a picture of us doing the first part of the experiment. And it also, we go through the setup so you can actually get a sense of what the actual Breathing setup is. Breathing is mostly ah. an involuntary automatic. So you can get a sense of what the actual experiment looks like. Um, you know, while you're actually watching this, either now or if you watch it at a later time again, there are going to be values that we actually measure from her data for the vital, I mean, for the um, tidal volume, for the inspiratory reserve and the ERV, which you can then use to also calculate the vital capacity. Um, you need to get those from the video. Um, and here is a PDF that's going to have a printout of her, um, the plot of her breathing. And then you'll be able to take those values and you'll be able to annotate the graph and show, um, oh, here is the v tidal volume. Here's the IRV and show from here to here. This is where it is. This is how I'm, where it's measured from. And then what is the actual value? So part of this first part is just seeing how the setup works and also just getting a better understanding of what IRV, ERV are and see what these values were for her. Um, the system is not calibrated, um, so you don't trust these numbers as being her actual values. Um, plus, there's also a bunch of extra dead space because of the big tube she has to breathe through, so her tidal volume is going to be elevated. Um, but the numbers are suggestive. So here we go. Check out my cool little like splash screen. All right, so you were going settings, spirometry. And here on the top, we've got the, I'm going to focus, is the flow rate. So with positive flow, meaning air is being sucked into your subject and negative flow, meaning that air is blowing out of your subject. And below is the integration of flow, which is the volume in liters, which we will see increasing as the lungs inflate and we'll see decreasing as the lungs deflate. Here we have, here we have our subject. This is the mouthpiece hooked up to the little filter. This filter is the only disposable part of the system. At the end, we'll throw away the filter, but all the rest will be sterilized and reused. And this is the part that actually has the little screen in it with little hoses that go up to the spirometry pod to detect pressure differences so you can calculate the actual flow of air. Um, tubes facing upwards so any condensation does not pour down into the system. Um, so now while this is staying completely still and the system's warmed up, we now have to zero the system. So zero flow will be zero volume change. So here we're going up into spirometry pod. And click 
clicking on zero. And that should bring this line up to zero, saying no flow if no breathing in. And then if we click on start, we can double check that the volume stays relatively constant if there is no breath coming in or out of the system. And so we are good to go for the next step. First, we'll put on the nose clips. Make sure that all the breath coming in and out is through the mouth. Obviously, it's a little awkward. It takes a little while to start breathing normally. Um, as we have our subject, we're going to see our subject breathe in strongly, and we'll see what happens to the direction. It's going up and have her breathe out, flow outward. We see the volume goes down. That is what we want to see. And so now, as she continues breathing, notice that there's a lot more dead space because of this tube, so it's gonna, you probably have to breathe deeper to actually feel like you're properly ventilating. Okay. And here we just see the top, which is the, as she breathes in, the flow is going positive. When she breathes out, she hold your breath for a moment. Then there's zero flow, meaning that there's no air coming in or out. Breathe in, or that's breathing out, and breathing in goes up and down. So, looking good. So, at this point, let's stop again. Final volumes. All right, so here we're going to have our subject just breathe easy. And if we go look here, We can just see the volume goes down as she breathes out, comes back up as she breathes in, out, and in. And now what we're going to have our subject do an inspiratory reserve. So she's going to, on her next inhale, she'll just breathe in as much as she possibly can. There we see all that extra volume in, and now she's going to breathe out and go back to her quiet breathing, her tidal breathing. Good job. Mm -hmm. And we also saw another function of the respiratory system, which is vocalization. Mm -hmm. All right, so now we still see our subject doing the quiet breathing. What she's going to do now on her Next exhale, she's going to continue past the normal exhale till it's all out, the expiratory reserve. Oh, there she goes. And now well, she's back to normal breathing there. You can see an expiratory reserve is typically not as much as an inspiratory reserve but we see that it's down lower than the normal. So this is looking good. Let's um, give this a pause. All right, let's just go from the trough to the peak of just a quiet breath. And we look at the volume here. We can see it says about 0.73 liters. Now, our computer operator here is going to put the marker at the top of a normal inhale, but now fly her cursor up to the top of the inspiratory reserve. And we can see that it is about 1.4 liters of volume above a normal inhale. And now our operator is gonna take the marker and put it right at the bottom of the exhale. We can just do it there even. And then go to the bottom of the expiratory reserve. And we can look at the volume again. Here we see it's about 0.2 liters 
Um, note that we did not actually calibrate this system. So these volumes are not necessarily accurate. They are just representative. Okay, so there we have all of her main breath volumes for her vital capacity. It would just be a sum of all three of those. Okay. All right, so. Well, All right, so. Uh, let me stop sharing a second. How do I do that? So are there any questions about, about that? Um, maybe I should. So that, you know, that one of the nice things about having it in the computer is measuring those distances is really easy using the little marker function and you're able to just easily tell. And so again, in the printout, you're gonna to wanna to use those values, but also make sure you show on your printout where the values are measured from where to where. Like you can use that video there. You can see where the marker was dropped and where the cursor went to to see from where to where were we actually measuring. So make sure when you're under, trying to understand IRV that you really get, it's like the top of the normal inhale, then above that. So just kind of putting that out there. Um, it's very freaking disconcerting for me because it's completely silent. I don't see any faces or hear anything. So I have no idea if anybody's there at all. <laughs> it's, it's so weird. We're here. I missed the title volume on the video, but I'll just go back. It's okay. So, um, yeah, so we measured it in the very beginning, measured it really fast. So that you were watching the very first of all the, eventually we ended up coming to campus a couple of times and spending a few full days making videos, but that was our very first try and it had lots, yeah, it's definitely the kind of, we, we got better at actually realizing like, oh, don't, don't go so fast or try to like make sure we spend a little more time. So that the title volume is there, but it goes really fast. Um, so it is there though. So the next part is gonna be this pulmonary function test with the forced, forced vital capacity. It's actually pretty cool. The system will automatically take all these measurements off of your, um, your force vital capacity. So we'll watch that happen right now. Um, back to the screen here. Pulmonary function tests, two minutes and 20 seconds. Again, with Tina at the controls and Becky breathing. All right, so now our subject is going to do some quiet breaths and then go into a forced vital capacity. So, and point, point the thing away from the operator, please. All right, here we go. And then back into some quiet breathing. And if we take a look at the volumes here on the screen, we see a beautiful pattern of the tidal breaths followed by a, an inspiratory reserve, directly followed by the expiratory reserve back into quiet breathing. So we can now pause this and select some in leading breaths and outgoing breaths and then that's perfect. Now, now we are going to go into the data window. And there we have this beautiful picture here. 
um, which you will have access to. To print. Yeah, so we're going to print this and the values we'll be able to get off of the report, which we will get in just a moment. So this is showing the peak inspiratory flow and peak expiratory flow, as well as the volumes for forced vital capacity and forced expiratory volume in one second on the bottom. Okay, so next report. Now the report. And this we will also have for you. This is the actual values which you can use to add to that previous graph. So you actually have numerical values. Right, so just want to reiterate, I wrote it in the, in the module, but you don't print this out. Use these numbers to draw the values on that previous, the actual graph, the actual picture. You know, this will give you, you know, what is the actual volume for the FVC and the FEV1. This will actually give you the actual um, peak inspiratory flow, like how fast was the air coming in when, when she was breathing in, when she was breathing out. Um, so use these to annotate, but don't print this out necessarily. Um, over here, um, average VT, this is the average tidal volume. It says 0.75 liters. F is frequency, how fast she was breathing. So it says like 20, you know, basically 20 breaths per minute. Um, this VE, this minute volume, this is actually just how many liters per minute are um, coming in and out. So it's, it's basically just gonna be just, yeah, it's just the um, frequency, the, wait a second. Yeah, this, so 14, 14 liters per minute is basically her tidal volume, how much volume per one breath times how many breaths per minute. Um, this is something you can change pretty dramatically depending on your body's needs. Um, I have, I have some value of that. Um, or, oh, I don't. Where is it? I'll, I'll find it for you later. The actual, yeah, you can actually. Oh, here, I, you know, quiet breathing is often somewhere only around six liters per minute. Like when you are like really intensely exercising, you can increase that up to about like two hundred liters per minute just by breathing really fast and having really deep breaths, right? So it's, this is just kind of how much volume per breath times breath per minute. So quiet breathing is usually pretty low, but it can go way up. Um, so this is the spirometry report, which you are going to use to basically go back. You're going to use that to annotate this picture here um, once the system stops giving us this little wheel of death thing here. Oh, come on. Okay. Right, so P, peak inspiratory flow, peak expiratory flow, FEV, FE, FEV1, FEC. Here they all have just letters but you can use the numbers, the quantitative values on that report to write on top of this and add that in to give yourself more information. Um, so then, the last part of this lab is about coughing. Um, so we talked about coughing a little bit when we mentioned the idea of clearing stuff. How do you clear out your respiratory system. You know, one way are these explosive air blasts. You basically close the glottis, build up the pressure and open it, <coughs> and all of a sudden the air comes out with this big impulse. If you wanted to do it, clear your upper nasal passages, you could do a sneeze, but we're doing a cough here. And so what we want to do is look at a cough more closely. We're going to have our subject cough, 
And then we can look at two things. We can look at the thing for measuring, the flow rate, how fast is the air coming out? And then we can also look at the volume, like how much air came out when she coughed. And it's actually pretty interesting. It might be a little non-intuitive when, when you see what happens here. So this is the last part of the lab we're gonna do, which is, oh, we have to escape out of this. The next report. And coughing. Starring Becky Brown as the coffer. All right, so now our subject is going to do some quiet breathing and then she is going to cough. And just like a cough, like just something to <clears throat> try to get out. She's breathing. Oh, just one cough, one cough. Mm -hmm. Let's do one cough. <clears throat> All right, now let's take a look. All right, so this is nice. This is really nice. We can see on the top the flow. When the cough is happening, we see a very high outward flow, those, those spikes going downward, that is saying there's a high flow rate of air out of our subject. If you look at the volume change, however, at that exact same time on the lower graph, we see that the volume really is not all that different from a normal exhale. So take note of that. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, so let me stop my sharing. Stop sharing. So what do you make of that? Why do you think, why is that kind of important that the flow, there was this very strong outward flow, but that the volume really didn't look any different from a normal exhale. And maybe because you only have a small amount of expiratory uh, reserve. Yeah, so that's definitely involved. And what would happen if you kind of just blew it all out in one big go? You'd have to inhale very quickly. Um, not even that. Remember, you're coughing because something's stuck in oh, your throat. Yeah. Right, so you don't actually have an option to inhale quickly afterwards if you didn't dislodge it in that first cough because you're still blocked. Right, so what, what is this buying you to actually not have, not blow out your whole expiratory reserve in a cough? So that makes sense. So if you didn't clear it the first time, you still have something left? Exactly. Okay. So can, are other people actually following Stephen there? Yeah. Right, so it's like if I, if I, have something I just like, maybe I'm in, I don't know, I'm in the Groundhog Day and the dude who ate that two big piece of steak that's stuck in his throat. Um, and if I blew out my entire expiratory reserve trying to cough it out in one big go, <coughs> and it didn't work, I'm screwed. There's nothing left. Expiratory reserve means it's everything I can blow out beyond my normal exhale. So I'm done. But if I go, <coughs> right, I've got a number of them in me because the amount of volume isn't as huge. So I actually have a bunch of coughs before I totally run out of air. But what is important is that the air that's coming out is coming out at a super high flow rate. And that is going to be this impulse that hopefully knocks the blockage free. 
You know, so in your discussion, you know, you're going to print out the graph that you have showing the flow and the volume during the coughs. And you're going to want to make sure you notate where the cough is happening. And also make sure in your discussion you talk about, you know, how the flow and the volume are pretty different when you look at the cough and why that that's important. So, I mean, the first time I saw one of these graphs, I was kind of, it was kind of shocking to me to see, you just get this as idea that if coughs are dramatic. I mean, the thing Becky was doing in the beginning where I was asking her to cough and she was like, <coughs> you know, everybody does that. I always have to, I mean, that's, that's really classic. I think because coughs just seem dramatic. They're energetic and you just get caught up in them. And you're assuming that there's got to be just buttloads of air coming out. But it's actually more kind of a limited amount of air coming out really fast. So again, I think that's a really nice thing you can see clearly on these graphs of flow and volume at the same time. Um, what else on this one? I should just mention, assuming that you have not cleared out your um, airways and you still can't breathe, are you going to be able to call for help? Are you going to be able to say, please, I'm suffocating. I can't breathe. Help me. No. No. Why is that? You wouldn't have, you wouldn't have air left. Exactly. You need to have airflow to vibrate your vocal cords. So if you are genuinely choking and you've already exhausted your ability to try to get dislodge it on your own, you actually can't. So if somebody, how do you know if somebody at your dinner table is actually choking and desperately needs your help? What's the universal sign? They put their hands to their neck. Right? Because you can't say, I'm choking. You have to, I can't tell you, but I can't breathe. Please help me before I'm dead. So that's something that really uh, to know as, as well. If you are choking and you've exhausted your ability to dislodge the obstruction, you can't tell anybody vocally that something's wrong. You need to, you need to act it out. Or if you are on the other side, you should be able to recognize that in somebody and know that they are, that they're choking and you need to help, help them out. You know, we talked about the Heimlich maneuver. One thing, again, that is taking additional pressure on the thoracic cavity, additional compression of the lungs, which increases pressure beyond what the person could have done on their own with their normal muscles, and that that can actually push out a little bit of that residual volume that's still in the lungs that normally that is still left after an expiratory reserve. So that's how Heimlich maneuver works. If you, even after they have already completed or expelled their entire expiratory reserve, if you manually compress them and increase the pressure beyond what they could have done naturally, you can actually push out a little, little bit of that residual volume and maybe that will be the extra little bit that's needed to dislodge the steak you're choking on or whatever. Um, so, are there any questions about all of this? Now this, this, yeah, it's, this is the, this lab is more fun when we're doing it. Um, although it's also kind of embarrassing because you kind of put on a little thing on your nose, you go, you know, it's very awkward, but it's still pretty fun. Um, but minimally, you can, you're going to get a sense of what are the important um, lung volumes, this relationship between flow and volume, and how we use like forced vital capacity in FEV1 to try to assess um, if you have healthy, healthy, um, respiratory function and and then see a cough in more detail and really understand you know what it's doing and how the volume and the flow are different um, so are there any questions about any of this 
I just had a quick question uh, about some of the differences between part one and part two. Uh -huh. um, in part one, the subject's vital capacity was 2.34 liters. Uh -huh. But in part two, it was 2.1, the force volume capacity was 2.14. Um, is I that would, just in the uh, I don't trust any of, don't trust the number. Okay. And in reality, Becky's vital capacity is going to be higher than that. That's right. really low for somebody. Okay. Yeah, normally, if you were using this in a, like for, for more quantitative studies, they actually have, it's this huge syringe that carry, has one liter of air in it, and you jack it into the system, and you push one liter of air through there, and then you can calibrate it so it knows, oh, that is one liter. But we didn't do any of that. Okay. Um, the other thing in your lab notebook, it talks about correcting for, um, there's, a, there's a whole part we didn't show you because it, we don't need to do it, but think about air versus temperature. What happens if you take the same amount of air, the same volume of air, but then you warm it up? What happens to the volume? Expands. It expands. Yeah, right. Remember PV equals NRT, the volume of a gas is directly proportional to its temperature. So this gets kind of funny because I can show you here. I'll, I'll do this. It'll be kind of this last part. Um, when you breathe in, let's say you breathe in. Let's say this is our liters. This is our volume. Let's say you breathed in one liter of air. It's in your body now it's warming up. When you breathe out, it's warmer. We saw that last class where you, well, when Tina blew on the little thermometer, we saw that the air coming out was warmer. So if you blew out the exact same molecules of air that you breathed in, there'd be more volume coming out than came in. Then you breathed in another liter and breathed out that. So actually when you're doing these kind of experiments, you often have this trouble problem of the, of the graph walking downward because every time you breathe in and warm up the air, you'll breathe out more air. Um, so in reality, the effect is pretty small. We didn't even deal with it in our lab that we're showing you. But if you're wondering what it's talking about in your lab notebook, that's what it's talking about. There is a correction technique to try to get around this. We are not using it in the um, videos that you saw. You don't have to address it in your write-up either. But just kind of putting out there why that's in there. And it, actually, and it is kind of just a fun physics thing that if you breathe out the same air you breathe in, you actually are breathing out a larger volume because air expands as it gets heated. It's kind of like a frog. So we can hop to it and do the write-ups. Um, I know that I've been, I have not got, I on my list to do right now as, as I um, log off here is to finally go through the, um, the research project um, proposals. And I did look, I looked at a number of them and they looked fine, but I want to formally go through each of them and give any relevant comments. Um, you should be receiving those within the, within the hour or so. Um, and I will also be formally writing up the grading rubric for that in the next couple of hours and have that um, up there. So you can actually, I know some people have expressed interest in just making sure all the ducks are in a row so they can just dig into that and get it going. So I will get that going. Um, if you have any questions about any material for the exam over the next, um, you know, this week or weekend, just email me and I will do my best to get back to you. And otherwise, Quick question, does the ECG lab have data we need to add into our lab? Um, yeah, so someone else had this. I, maybe I should rearrange it. Let me show you what it looks like. 
Um, hold on one second here. So if you go into the modules and you go to the, um, EKG lab. So this part that says doing the EKG lab. If you go in here, there's the videos that show what we were doing, but then there are links to PDF files that okay. have, this is like her, her, you know, the normal EKG here. Um, there's the one showing the EKG and the pulse that you were using for the um, calculating okay. the pulse wave. So they're kind of hidden in here. Okay, perfect. Thanks. And it might make sense for me to move them out, although at this point, maybe I'm just going to put a, a note on the outside of the module saying, look inside here to find these. Because you're not, yeah, other, other people have also had trouble finding these. So, but yeah, so that's where they are. Uh, what the actual lab? instructions were or something not the data but that works thank you wait so so what's that say it again i just thought those files were the instructions for the lab yeah no i i, I didn't I, look in them so so i okay. i'll go in and try to make it a little more clear in a, a few moments okay no problem okay um any other questions comments otherwise All right, so I hope you all have a good weekend and study well. Again, make sure you think about blood pressure, think about cardiac output, think about renin angiotensin mechanism. You know, all that, you know, there's a lot of interrelating things. It's kind of cool once you get it all, but it can be overwhelming at first because there's a lot of different things that all affect each other and are all kind of interrelated. So writing up some kind of a, I don't know, some, what do they call it, concept map or whatever, where you can kind of just see how these things relate to each other can be helpful. And again, at kind of the top of the whole pile is going to be, you know, blood pressure is cardiac output times resistance, you know, and beyond that, lots of things affect cardiac output or different things affect resistance. Primarily blood vessel diameter affects resistance, but it could also be length of blood vessels or viscosity of blood. Lots of things affect cardiac output. It could be heart rate, or it could be stroke volume. And then stroke volume is further affected by end diastolic and end systolic volumes. So all of those things are all ultimately tying back to blood pressure. So make sure, like when you think about what can control blood pressure, um, heart rate, because it controls your cardiac output, which controls blood pressure, or end systolic volume, because that controls that controls stroke volume, which controls cardiac output, which controls blood pressure. So make sure you kind of think about how all these things kind of relate to each other um, when you're when you're when you're doing all this. So again, if you have questions or comments about any of it. Just let me know. Um, I have office hours today as well as tomorrow. Tomorrow from 11.30 to 12.30. So you can ask, ask questions there as well. Or else I will see you, see you online on Monday morning for exam three, a cardiovascular and respiratory edition. All right, see you all. Have a good weekend, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. You're welcome.